All right, so this is the split body problem. And why the heck do we need to think about parents, offspring, and sex when we try to understand how life reproduces itself? And this is uh, Gunnar O. Babcock, postdoctoral associate in the Department of Biology at Duke University, in North Carolina, whose research is primarily in the philosophy of biology. He lives in Western Mass. Okay. If you split yourself down the middle to become two people, would you survive the process? And if you did, would your other half be your child, your clone, or your sibling? Would this create two instances of the same you, existing simultaneously in two places at the same time? Or would it create two entirely new people, causing you to, sudden, to suddenly cease to exist? While such thought experiments raise baffling questions about personal identity, there is a more fundamental problem I want to consider. Would splitting into be an instance of reproduction or an entirely different kind of process? All right, so immediately, I mean, we should um, recognize that this is from Star Trek, clearly, when there were two Rikers. And when they split, there'd be two instances of Riker. And so this is just, a, you know, a Star Trek reference, clearly. Uh, let's see, can I make this bigger? All right, so... So that y'all might be able to follow along. Alright, so there we go. Oh wow, you could like listen to the whole thing. Interesting. When we think about how organisms reproduce, we don't tend to think of splitting bodies. We think of sex. We tend to think of animals such as panda bears, leopards, ravens, or any other large multicellular organisms having sex, because becoming pregnant or laying fertilized eggs, and giving birth. It isn't surprising that this is how we think new organisms come into existence. Sexual reproduction is, after all, the form of reproduction that nature has selected for creatures like us. But sex is not the way most reproduction takes place. No. I mean, you gotta remember, mammals and, like, birds and stuff reproduce. Size matters? Oh my god. What is this? Wait, what did you link me, Cynosemiotics? Hope this is, like, not terrible philosophy limits of film okay maybe we can do that later or depending how long this takes maybe next time but, but uh valpo re uh, requested the aeon article so but sex is not the way most reproduction takes place no i mean remember m we're not the uh, dominant species on the uh, planet like in terms of mass so most forms of life on this planet create other living things through asexual processes, and there are many ways this can happen, as we'll see. Some of the most common forms are similar to the thought experiment above, a body splits in two. Nearly all prokaryotic microbes, such as bacteria, reproduce through various forms of this process, such as binary fission, when a body separates into two new bodies. However, it's not always clear what kind of relation result from fission as in the thought experiment above. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I've noticed it. there is a problem on my side. I'm using way too much CPU than I should be. I mean, I'm only at 15%, but I shouldn't even be using 15% right now. So I'm getting a frame, not frame drops, but my frame rate is slow. And I noticed uh, Twitch has been... Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Cynosemiotics. Cynosemiotics gifted two bits. Cynosemiotics says Frankers one, Frankers one. So, yeah. So, thank you for the bits. But, yeah, and I, I've noticed Twitch has been a little wonky with uh, their speeds, too. But it's not been terrible. But I apologize for the lag. Yeah. Continuing. And uh, as per everyone watching, please ask questions if you want more analysis. I do know something of philosophy of biology. As a philosopher of biology, some of my research considers... Hey, evolve yourself. How's it going? It's going well. We're reading this thing about, uh, you know, reproduction in terms of, uh, you know, not sexual reproduction, but like what it is to split in terms of like cells split and they reproduce. How you doing? Evolve yourself. Let's give uh, evolve yourself a little shout out. Hope you're doing well. Oopsie. So yeah. Everyone go, Evolve Yourself uh, streams meditation, a little bit of chess, a little bit of philosophy. It's a good stream. You should check it out if you're interested in uh, that sort of stuff. So you can ask him, like, he does mind, uh, what is it, mind, philosophy of science, and uh, what's the other one he does? Ah, always forget. You know what? I have it written down. There we go. Mind, metaphysics, science, and chess. There we go. So those are the uh, philosophy streamers and Evolve Yourself is in the, in the crew. So. 
Yeah, metaphysics and uh, if you want to check out, like, you want to like relax, go meditate with Evolve Yourself. It's good for relaxation, clear your mind. It's been stressful. Anywho, feel free to ask questions. Let me know how what's what's going on. As philosopher, as a philosopher of biology, some of my research considers what counts as a biological individual and how biological individuals are connected to each other. It seems to me that our concept of reproduction often distorts how we think about organisms coming into existence. This isn't surprising. It's a concept developed by 18th century naturalists who knew very little about the fission process we can observe today. What needs to be done to align our concept of biological reproduction with the fission process seen throughout much of life? Where to start? Also, most sex doesn't result in reproduction. Yes, but when it does with humans... <laughs> It usually involves sex, although not always. To think about this, we first need to figure out how we understand reproduction itself. This may seem like a theoretical exercise, but it, but a lot is at stake in how we define the concept. Our ability to identify species, aliens, and even the branches on the three tree, on the tree of life hinges on the concept. Composed of Composed of reproductive links between organisms, much of the tree of life rests on our understanding of reproduction. How we think about vertical lines of descent between parents and offspring across generations can have massive implications for our evolutionary models. Say an organism survives reproduction fission and has 40 offspring. All of those offspring, 40 bodies that split off over time, are one generation away from their parent. However, if you think an if you think an organism doesn't survive fission, then the organisms born after 40 splits are 40 generations removed from the first organism to break into two. Thus, whether two organisms are understood as being just a few generations apart, or potentially millions of generations apart, hinges on how you understand reproductive fission. You know, I gotta wonder here, just like... Re is is reproduction really what's at stake, or is evolution what is at stake? Evolution is the more important concept. Reproduction is one way of continuing to evolve, but there may be other ways. Like you can, you know, technically just modify DNA. That does not take uh, reproduction, and you know, a lot of um, I'm sure the author is going to get to this. They clearly know their stuff. You know, that's how viruses evolve. Like, they're just swapping DNA in all the time. Like, this is what viruses really do. And, like, bacteria do. They're just swapping DNA constantly. This is really how uh, they evolve. They don't, like, reproduce so much, but they swap. Uh, they do some sort of, like, sideways swap with um, other living um well, like the viruses nearby them. So it's not just that they reproduce, but that they are constantly swapping DNA without reproducing. So there are other ways to do this. Astrobiologists are also heavily invested. You know, epigenetics is, yeah, that's other stuff. Your genes change based on your, how you live. It's, um, you know, we're back to Lamarckian theory nowadays. That's right. Astrobiologists are also heavily invested in how reproduction is defined. If we're ever going to find life outside Earth, they will need to know how to tell the living from the non-living. One of the more prominent theories about how to do this is by determining whether an extraterrestrial candidate can reproduce or pass on its genes. Oh, speaking of the extraterrestrials, there was just a headline that someone in China said that they found aliens. And then the Chinese, and like then they got pulled down off uh, the Chinese web. So this, uh, this could be kind of exciting. Maybe, this, maybe some Chinese scientists did find uh, evidence of aliens. It got pulled down quick, but, you know, that's kind of exciting, you know? <laughs> Maybe someone out there did find, uh, like, you know, a repeating signal or something that shouldn't be repeating in the way it is. Although, after the hullabaloo with the idiot uh, Google engineer, I'm not feeling very uh, excited about that, uh, optimistic about it. Continuing. According to this theory, a capacity to rep reproduce could be one of the defining characteristics of life. Reproduction is also central to the way we define species. The German-born evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer's biological species concept, the most common concept used to define a species, treats them as interbreeding, or potentially interbreeding, populations. Updating how we think about reproduction then creates a series of difficult identity problems that challenge the foundations of many of our ideas about life. It's perhaps surprising, then, that the concept of biological reproduction, which underpins our ability to find species, the search for alien life, and the concept of evolution, emerged only around the mid-18th century. The work of the French naturalist Georges-Luc 
George Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, and the French philosopher Pierre Louis Marpertuis marks the beginning of the idea that we think of as reproduction today. Prior to their work, organisms, organisms were believed to form through generation, not reproduction. The French biologist Francois Jacob, Jacob's The Logic of Life nicely illustrates the importance of the historical shift between these concepts. Speciation is a palimpsest. Yes. Um, all these words, all of these concepts are incredibly, like, they, they fit like a time and a place and like a certain set of things. But, like, over the course of all life, very few of our concepts hold universally. And it's just, um, all of these things are just really difficult to nail down. And a lot of science is this way, actually, but especially in uh, biology. Like, you don't even have, for the most part, the biologist is not working with, like, very stable concepts like electron like you can say like there's an there's a some sort of identity of like you know a species but even then it's um it isn't like electron yeah but yeah if you got more to say let me know before reproduction, it was generally believed that animals were generated in a similar way to anything else, houses or statues, for example, through the right combination of matter and form. Thinkers as far back as Plato and Aristotle believed that life was created by an immutable set of forms or patterns that could re recombine in different materials or, as Jacob says, through different combinations of visible structures. This is the atomist theory. It goes back to, like, atoms. Like, you're just combining different, like, little bits of things, and you put them together, and then you get different stuff at the end. And then, like, it grew up, and then you had, like, essences, and you were... You were putting together these different humors and then you'd have a vital humor that would be like enliven living things and like including people so it's basically these theories have not actually left us they've just evolved so yeah continuing forms were supposed to function one might say like cookie cutters thinking about living organisms in this way rendered them similar to other physical objects just as the bronze statue bronze of a statue could take on different forms so could life the only thing that set life apart from everything else was in the was that it needed an extra nudge to get going some believed this nudge was divine for others a causal impetus was contained in the seed or germ or it was inherent in the final cause in the of the form in the way this that a statue comes into being by taking the right kind of shape. Yeah, so we could do some Hegel too on this. That's fair. The way like things come in and come out of existence. So, yeah. All right. This is why talk of monsters abounded prior to the 18th century. Tales of animals with deformities or creatures with amalgamations of different animal parts. In the 16th century, the French surgeon Ambrose Paré dedicated an entire book to them called On Monsters and Marvels, where he reports on all sorts of implausible chimeras, such as a human child with a frog's face. Paré wasn't the first. Millennia earlier, Aristotle gave an extensive account of monsters and his On the Generation of Animals as well. From Aristotle to Paré and beyond, talk of animals possessing strange mixes of parts seemed reasonable because the concept of generation isn't constrained by the past. Each instance of generation could recombine and form matter in new ways. Yeah, the synthesis, things coming together. Well, things are coming together and going apart. I just want to point out, we still talk this way. A lot of times, though, it's just focused on the mind. You, nowadays, we have, like, psychological monsters who are doing the same sort of... You've got strange mixes of, like, psychologies, and this is what a like uh, our, like the Hannibal Lecters of the world are. You've got these weird mixes of uh, different parts, and that makes a monster, and it's psychological. So we have not escaped this kind of thinking. It has just gotten shunted into a different area. So each generation... Can, we combine and format in new ways, and now we just have, like, you know, psychological monsters as opposed to physical monsters. But, I mean, that's just an evolution of the same concepts. Nothing has gone away, really. The idea behind this is somewhat like building with Lego blocks. The blocks connect in many ways and are limited only by their own shapes and how they can link together. Similarly, the forms of animals could take were constrained only by the kinds of matter that made them up. Flesh, bl bone, flesh, blood, bone, feathers, scales, and the principles that governed all physical objects. From the perspective of generation, a human child with a frog's face seems perfectly reasonable. 
Well, you got to remember, we're grafting. We graft different things things now onto animals i mean it just takes more effort but like we grow um like you know ears on like you can see the weird pictures of like ears grown on like the backs of like rats or like pigs or something it's um interesting to say the least contrast this with the modern notion of reproduction from today's vantage point, understanding an organism requires understanding its evolutionary history, the lineage of ancestors from which it's descended. Naturalists in the 18th century began to notice the importance of biological history when they started experimenting with hybrids by breeding different species. When testing which animals could hybridize, they observed that it was rare for animals to belonging to different species to successfully interbreed, and even when they did, very few of the resulting hybrids were fertile. This made the idea of monsters created through generation look quite implausible, if not impossible. Armed with such observations, naturalists and philosophers came to see that generation wasn't good at explaining how new organisms came into existence. <coughs> organisms weren't like houses or statues. They weren't generated in the same way a builder makes a house with matter of wood and to form a blueprint. Instead, an organism's anatomy and physiology were constrained by what they'd inherited from their ancestors. Understanding a specific animal required understanding its history or lineage. A house or statue can be understood by its physical structure, but a real under to to re, but to really understand life, 18th century naturalists realized they needed to go beyond the physical structure of the organism. In this way, the difference between generation and reproductive reproduction involves distinctions between space and time. Generation was concerned with space, form, physical structure, but reproduction introduced time, a historical component. The conceptual shift from generation to reproduction marks one of the most important transitions in the history of biology. It is one of the factors that led Charles Darwin's epic-making theory of evolution. You know, I guess this is a historical point. I'm not 100% certain about this... Um, is really the critical dis distinction here. But the idea of like time being important was super important to Charles Darwin, but I'm not sure if this is actually, I mean, I don't know. Like this is a little suspect to me right here, this distinction, or at least what they're trying to do with it. The idea that like reproduction introduced time, no, it produced a genealogy, but it, it, the space is different. The time, I'm not sure if this is well said, the historical component is the genealogy that you had like a history going back specifically through history of your family. But um, that's a different thing than just time. So. Of course, since the 18th century, biologists have learned vastly more than just this about life. The biological philosopher Maureen O'Malley has shown that, by most measures, the vast majority of life on Earth is microbial. Contained within about one ton of soil are 10 to the 16 prokaryotic organisms, significantly more than the mere 10 to 11 stars in the Milky Way. Conservative estimates suggest that half of the Earth's total biomass is made up of these tiny prokaryotic microbes. In the Earth's oceans, they can constitute closer to 90% of the biomass. Yeah, Cinesemiax, time is baked into that, I agree. Um, that's why I was just... Yeah, I, I, I was saying I was a little uncomfortable with the distinction because I, saying it was just time sort of missed the point. You, I, I would have preferred genealogy. I don't think that would have really thrown the, the discussion there and it would have been more specific. But yeah, if you want to say a big thing, like then it's time. Like, just the general concept. So, time is baked in, but, like, the more important concept is the biological history. And they did say history there, but it's not merely time. Each reproduction event takes time and the events outside of that system. You see, that was my kind of my other point. Reproduction does take time, but generation also takes time. Like, what the uh, author was saying, the old way of just, like, putting things together, that also exists within time. It's not the same concept of time, but you still have to, like put things together like um you know this is a uh, frankenstein is frankenstein's monster has to be put together it's not like it didn't exist outside of time it didn't just show up so there was still um a generation there of frankenstein's monster but like it's the specific kind of a generation or the the specific kind of a genealogy the kind of time matters the historical uh, biological history matters it's not just that you can put stuff together randomly like uh franken dr frankenstein did okay 
In terms of the number of species, microbes put the rest of the plant's life to shame. Depending on whom you talk to, there are at least a trillion different species of microbes on Earth. Yes, a trillion species, not microbes. It is not an exaggeration to say that life on Earth is microbial, with the comparative rare exception of the odd macroorganism. How are these microbes relevant to our concept of reproduction? Their staggering presence means that life as we know it is overwhelmingly, by many orders of magnitude, asexual. And this extends far beyond the world of microbes. There are, multitudes, uh, there are a multitude of plant species that reproduce asexually or through a combination of both sexual and asexual processes. Perhaps you've owned one of these asexual plants. Victorsaurus, welcome. Evo Psych student here. If there are any questions about implications of evolutionary theory, I may be able to offer some ideas. Thank you, uh, Victorsaurus, and welcome in. If you've got any questions about the philosophy of biology, feel free to ask. <laughs> I'm on that side. <laughs> but yeah, Evo Psych student. You know, my dad actually taught uh, evolutionary psych at some point in his life. He uh, thought it was an interesting topic. So maybe you've owned an asexual plant. Yes. A shoot cut from the common house plant Epipremnum aurenum, sometimes known as devil's ivy, will continue to grow when replanted in another pot. That's a form of asexual reproduction. Your father, well, he actually got interested in after I got uh, after I got interested in philosophy of biology. I uh, caused him to be interested in it, so I actually know a lot of it. And then he, uh, then we discussed it a little bit. I don't um. He was not a uh, like this was not like his main thing. He just he ended up teaching a class once, so I'm not. You probably still know more, quite a bit more than I do on uh, Evo Psych. Some animals, aphids, flatworms, and even certain lizards, reproduce through other kinds of asexual processes, too. So aside from bringing new organisms into existence, what do these processes have in common with sexual reproduction? Currently, perhaps the best candidate for a general account of reproduction is offered by the American philosopher James Greisemer. He suggests that reproductive processes generally share two features. First, there must be an overlap of material parts, that is, the physical ma material that make up an organism between the parents and offspring, and second, those parts must go on to develop. And while there are other accounts of reproduction, Greisemer presents a compelling case. His first criterion, material overlap, requires that some material part of an offspring has been part of the parent. This criterion is important because without it, all sorts of processes that are obviously not instances of biological reproduction might qualify as reproduction. For example, a photocopier making copies of a sheet of paper is not an instance of reproduction because no material from the original paper is transferred to the copy. That's why photocopying is mere, mere production rather than reproduction. The second criterion, development, is also important to block other cases of production that are obviously not instances of reproduction either. For example, cutting a piece of paper in half produces two sheets of paper from one original. In this case, part of the material from the original is used to produce a new sheet of paper, but we don't want to call this reproduction either. For this reason, the criterion of development is necessary. For a process to be one of genuine reproduction, not only must material transfer from parent to offspring, but the offspring must be able to develop the capacity to rep reproduce too. The sheet of paper fails this test. Well, why? You can cut a piece of paper into a, a fort's. I mean, it will fail eventually, but like on the piece of paper one, it doesn't seem to do it. It has to be able to do it in some sense indefinitely, but even all organisms fail that. Like species go out of, they, they go extinct. So this right here, all of a sudden is um, a little questionable what you mean by development here. You have to be able to somehow grow and develop and then reproduce again, but that's not entirely clear because you can split a cut piece of paper into a you can cut a second the piece of paper again and so it can reproduce again now everything's getting smaller but like that isn't clear why smallness and size matters as a uh, synosemiotics was reminding us all right continuing Thus, Greisemer offers us some good reason to think that what's happening with sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction shares important similarities that can't be disregarded, similarities that make these processes quite unlike the production of houses or statues. Yeah, I'm very worried about this development uh, thing here, but let's just keep going and assume that there is something that develops that um, it's not just you know it when you see it, as opposed to cutting a piece, piece of paper into a half and then forts. 
Now let's think about this account of reproduction in terms of our strange case of fission or splitting. After all, fission-like processes are the way most forms of life reproduce. What happens when a microbe such as an E. coli bacterium undergoes binary fission? Much like the sheet of paper that's cut in half during binary fission, a single bacterium splits into two bacteria. And when an E. coli bacterium splits, the two resulting bacteria are almost perfectly identical to one another. Reproduction through these kinds of fission processes meets Gleismer's two criterion as there is both material overlap between the parent and offspring, and the two bacteria that emerge from a split bacterium can develop the capacity to have offspring of their own. But how do we think about the identity of these two bacteria? It's similar to the thought experiment of a person splitting down the middle to become two people, the Riker thing from uh, Star Trek. He gets a, you know, a transporter thing where he gets sent to two different places. So how do you uh, deal with uh, the transporter uh, errors and two Rikers? It's the stuff of science fiction, not to mention the starting point of philosophical debates about the nature of personal identity. Take, for example, the American philosopher David Lewis, who has argued that if someone split to become two other people, both would be instances of that single person because one person possesses a multitude of identities, some of which could splinter off in the future. In arguing for this, he's not suggesting that we were all affected by something like multiple personality disorder. Rather, he's saying that it's quite common for one to think one thing to possess multiple identities. Think of a street that has forks. Imagine you're driving down a street that is both Route 23 and Washington Ave. Then you reach the fork. This, the street splits and you follow Route 23. Prior to the fork, the one street had two identities. Yeah, sure. Okay, whatever. That's a little funky, but we can go with that. But not everyone agrees with Lewis. The British philosopher Derek Parfit argues that one person splitting into two people results in that person's identity ceasing to exist in something that seems very unlike biological death, but where it's not entirely clear if the original person survives. Parfit thinks that each person after the split might retain the same beliefs, desires, and goals. However, seeing as plants and microbes don't obviously have these, it's unclear what of them survives. You know, I'm thinking about this right now. I'm thinking that, you know, when you, if you were to split, you would make two of me, like you were two Rikers or whatever. I'd say at the time of the split, they were basically, they were the same person. But then just like, uh, you know, Heraclitus says, you, you can't step, in, step into the same river twice. You're not the same person and the river's not the same river. Like, you're not the same person in your past. I think you're, we're asking the wrong question here. When you become two people, like two Rikers in a transporter accident, what happens is you're not the same person that you were two seconds ago. There were two of you, and so both of them are you at that time of the split, but then they immediately diverge, just as the water in a river is like not the same water. You are not the same person, and so they immediately diverge and become two people. Now, who is the original Riker? I don't know if there is an original person at that point. Like, this is a transporter accident, so it's very different because they're, uh, you know, a molecular, molecularly identical at the time of the split, but not immediately after. As soon as they're someplace else, they're seeing two different things. They're different people. And so, like, they diverge immediately. So... I don't think the person's identity ceases to exist any more than my identity I have right now when I'm talking to you now is not the same as my identity five seconds ago because I've moved on. I'm saying something different than I was 10 seconds ago now. So that's kind of how I feel about this the more I think about it. It says, at the time of the split, yeah, they're identical, but immediately, like the microsecond later, it diverges. That's it. Okay. These curious identity questions don't yet have an obvious answer, except for mine, of course, because I'm right, and it's unclear what kind of ancestral relation fission creates. A lot would likely depend on the particulars of the fission involving aging, growth, and in particular, symmetry. If there's perfect symmetry during fission, then perhaps Parfit is correct and certain organisms pop out of existence, meaning fission is not only reproduction, but also a st very strange kind of death. I mean, is my old self dead from like five seconds ago because... That person doesn't exist anymore. I mean, that's a weird, strange, very strange kind of death to say, I'm dead. My, I just died because I've moved forward in time. That just is the only thing that happened here. Now, if you split me into two, did I just die? I don't think so. So I find this death concept very strange. Okay. 
However, if fission isn't symmetrical, then some organisms might be more like Lewis's streets. If this is the case, perhaps colonies of bacteria are composed of many individuals that share a single identity. It's clear that these kinds of fission meet Greisenberg's criteria for reproduction, but the problem is that fission doesn't create clear links from parent to offspring, a clear vertical lineage of descent. This creates difficulties for our notions of reproduction. To return to the question that opened this essay, how do we define the relationship between organisms created through fission. Does this, process reprodu does this process produce clones, siblings, or just two instances of the original? To see why, let's return to the devil's ivy. Yeah, I mean, does anyone have any opinions on, like, what happens to you if you got split? I don't know. How long is this, anyway? Oh, this is not that bad. Okie dokie. I was at the S, the big S. Big S. Like big S, and I cannot lie. Say someone cuts a shoot from a mature devil's ivy plant. You had a. I hope you protected the spiders. Spiders are friends. They eat evil bugs. <laughs> Say someone cuts a shoot from a mature devil's ivy plant and repla replants the shoot in another pot where it develops. Oh, good. I'm happy. Size matters. Yes. <laughs> You know, sometimes if you refresh the stream, it does help a little bit. But uh, I don't know what's going on with why my stream has been slow. I mean, it's saying I'm not dropping frames, but my uh, CPU is rather, it's unnaturally high. So, we'll see. According to Greismer's criterion, this counts as an instance of reproduction. So when you cut a, you can take a shoot of a plant and you cut it over. Valpo says, my brother hates big ass and cannot tell the truth. Solve ye the riddle of Sir Mix-a-Lot. Wow, that's a. Uh, I I, I kind of love you for that, Valpo. That's a uh, kind of funny. The Sir Mix a Lot paradox. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna steal that. I think I'm gonna see if I can use that next time I'm hanging out with uh, logicians. No one's gonna get it, but like yeah, no one's gonna get it. Oh damn it, they're too old. Oh well. Oh uh, you you uh, you just you you. Hey, it's worth it. It's it, that that one's worth it. I mean, how many people come up with really good original jokes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember Victor Soros. No, um, all that happened when you went to get the spider. I scrolled down off the uh, to see how much uh, more uh, was to this essay, and I said, "I remember I'm at the big S." So I was like, I, "I'm at the big S. I, I like the big S, and I cannot lie." That was just the only. That was the only thing is I was marking my place in the essay because it's a web page. It's not a page number. So I was at the. Uh, I forget what this is called, uh, but the big S when you know you start a paragraph. Okay. Anywho. But yeah. Keep chatting. Let me know if there's anything uh, <laughs> matters that I say. So you cut a shoot from a mature devil's ivy plant and replant the shoot in another pot where it develops into a mature plant. According to Greismer's criterion, this counts as an instance of reproduction. But has the plant really reproduced in the sense of 18th century style reproduction? Is the original plant really apparent in the shoot its offspring? It's far from obvious. First, remember that the shoot and the original plant are genetically identical clones. All that changes is physical connectedness, but cutting and replanting a shoot doesn't resemble something like human birth. Other creatures are also cable, ca are, uh, other creatures are also able to persist through physical disconnectedness, like the immortal jellyfish Turritopsis dorini, which, depending on its environmental conditions, moves between being a physically connected mature medusa to an immature stage of disconnected polyps. When food is scarce or it's otherwise threatened, this jellyfish can break apart into a colony of polyps and then recombine again when conditions improve. Slime molds do something quite similar. The bodily transformations of Turritopsis dorini make the creatures of science fiction look tame. And then there are cases in the other direction where two physically disconnected organisms become physically continuous. For example, separate trees, sometimes even different species of trees, can grow together in a process known as inosu inosculation. inosculation. This happens when the trunks, branches, or roots of separate trees come in contact and then, over time, get end up get grafting to one another. 
When two physically separate trees grow into one another, do they become a new singular organism? Philosophers of biology and theoretical biologists are grappling with such questions, dragging the issue of what counts as biological individual into a metaphysical quagmire to which there are no obvious empirical solutions. Understanding when reproduction has taken place in these cases often depends on intuitions about physical connectedness. How physically connected does an organism need to be to still be an organism? In the case of inosculation, there is no test a bio biologist could conduct that would t will tell us whether the original plant is a parent or not. The problem is conceptual. What's it called? You can also go watch Ghost in the Shell, where uh, two people sort of meld in the same way to create a third. That's always fun. I like that movie. One possible solution to this conceptual issue can be found in the work of some botanists and biologists from the 1970s, including John Harper and Daniel Jansen, who introduced the concept of ramet and genet to distinguish between the different kinds of individuals that are found among certain plants and some animals. These concepts were developed to solve the puzzle of how to understand the relationship between genetically identical plants that appear to be separate individuals, such as dandelions. They introduced the idea that a set of genetically identical individuals form a single spatially discontinuous genet. At the same time, each of these individuals' dandelions in uh, excuse me. At the same time, each of these individual dandelions, physically separated from the rest, is a ramet. A group of ramets make up a genet. This pioneering work shows that the very real biological limitations that can come from assumptions about reproduction. Viewing life through the lens of 18th century naturalists distorts our sense of what an individual looks like because it assumes a world that resembles us. Instead, the concepts of Ramet and Gennett reveal that what counts as an individual can vary and that parent-offspring relationships are one of many possibilities. Yeah, my voice, yeah. Oh, I, uh, you know, I've been talking for an hour and a half and I don't talk that much normally. <laughs> this is the most talking I do, you know, anytime. And I don't smoke, although I'm not against smoking. Just don't get addicted to whatever it is you're smoking. While there are some good reasons to think that the Ramit and Gennett solution helps make sense of some curious problems regarding biological individuality, it doesn't completely solve the problem how to, to how, of how to understand reproduction. It doesn't tell us how Gennett's reproduce. Greisimer's criterion for reproduction works for Ramit's. There is both material overlap and development. Material parts are of a ramet are transferred to their offspring and those parts go on to develop. But the reproductive process of a ramet, an individual dandelion, is the growth and development of a gannet, a disparate grouping of genetically identical dandelions. If that's right, then how do gannets reproduce? From the perspective of a gannet, this process looks like development and growth, not reproduction. Too late. Uh, I'm sorry, cinesemiotics. Victor Sor says... I think a key noteworthy idea of being different is that most mutations are not beneficial, which is why, be why being tend to beings tend to reproduce into similar offspring. Mutations theoretically manifest a bit differently in asexual and sexual reproduction. Yeah, I mean, this is what's key in, um, of course, Darwin. It's uh, Darwin, is the three tenets of Darwin is, look, you've got um, reproduction, of course, um, parents have kids there's similarity like there's genetic similarity you look more like your parents there's variation though those variations matter and of course um the the, the variations matter in fitness the variations no excuse me there's reproduction so p the kids look like their parents there's variation so it's not I exactly identical and third the variations matter and that's what um makes a difference in the over the course of life and most of them of course genetic mutations aren't either are non-beneficial or are harmful all very rarely do like new characteristics come up i mean they come up eventually but yeah so this is the thing you it, the similarity is key now again this is the problem with the generation here the generation concept i was talking about above it's under described is one of these you, you like what victor is saying is like you're trying to do something similar like a degree of similarity, that's going to be subjective. What counts as more similar or less similar? Similar. You need a definition of that, and so there's going to be problems in what does it mean to reproduce when not just the like the material overlap, but what count what happens afterwards. There is material overlap, but of course, if I chop off my finger, 
like that's going to be the wrong sort of thing. My fingers, even if you could say my fingers started to like do stuff on its own, it wouldn't be the right sort of thing because it's like it, it doesn't, uh, you know, that's like the wrong sort of like generation. Like if your my finger were start to grow into something else, maybe. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't have the right kind of similarity at that point. Yeah. But that's the problem. Like, we don't understand these concepts. And, like, what the author is doing here is good. Like, for the most part, I agree with all the ways the author is going about these things. But there's going to be problems with the... There's still problems. And, like, the author is trying to talk about different problems here. But, like, they can't solve them. And so you're going to inherently... In some sense, this essay is just going to build up a uh, baggage. Like, this is one of these things that happens in these essays. You're going to build up philosophical baggage as the, over the course that you're going on because you can have more and more ideas that don't work together. And this is one of them. And I think uh, you're p- picking up on that, Victor Sor, that there has to be a similarity uh, concept here in the generation and uh, or even in the overlap. But um, it's uh, n- not discussed. And I think that's beyond the scope of this uh, essay. Okay. Reisemer seems to agree on this front. He acknowledges that there are times when the distinction between reproduction and development collapses, ceasing to be a meaningful division. But it's important to remember that these cases are not isolated or rare. Processes where the division becomes division between reproduction and development becomes entangled are among the most common biological processes. Victor Orr says, That's what annoyed me at times about philosophical ideas. Many, I, many do not often move forward and are just just a collection of a bunch of views. Oh, essays. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have, you know, you get to pick and choose what sort of problems you like. I like my philosophical problems. You can stick to your Evo psych, um, you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, you get the rhetor, retor, the retors, the rhetoricians and their stuff doesn't even move at all. They just like talking about talk and their stuff like has no movement, but they love it. So it's like if you like those sorts of discussions and you go deal with them, but like if you want to talk about like really slow moving stuff, then you talk philosophy and a little bit more fast moving is like science and uh, psychology. Like it's just uh, whatever's your speed. Like I like uh, problems that ain't been solved in 2000 years. There ain't no there's very little progress on logical uh, paradoxes. And so, you know, I don't really love paradoxes, but like that's something I've looked at before. So but I mean. We ain't made no progress yet, really. Or we made some, but, like, it ain't solved, so. Yeah. Processes where the division between reproduction and development become entangled are among the most common biological processes, far more common than the sexual processes we typically think of when we talk about reproduction. You know what the funny thing is? We talk about what we know because this is what we know. It's like, this is who we are. We reproduce in this way. And so the fact that it is common is not common for us. And so it's like I, I, I always get a little rankled about because this this sentence happens in all sorts of areas. Like they're always saying, oh, but like we just weren't paying attention. No, we're paying attention, but we're just paying attention to our lives. But like we don't always look everywhere else, but we know what we know. Victor Sorry says, I think there's a lot of potential power in philosophy. I mean to say that I wish formal logic was used more in logical essays to try and solve and derive inferences. Me too, Victor Sor. I wish we made more uh, sense of things. But uh, <laughs> we do what we can. <sighs> Just as we've discovered that there are very many different kinds of biological individuals, for example, rabbits and gannets, there are also very different kinds of reproductive processes that might not always create parent-offspring relationships. How do we begin to describe these processes? When you cut a shoot from some devil's ivy and replant it elsewhere, has a new entity come into existence, or is it more like Lewis's roads? Is each stem of the devil's ivy a possible fork in the road, each with its own identity, and all contained within a single plant that itself is just one identity of some other plant to which it was once connected? (laughs) Well, no, I know it wasn't meant as an attack, but I mean, it's just, you know, you get this in philosophy sometimes. You're like, well, you never solve anything. It's like, well, we like our problems and you like your problems. And, you know, what, what counts as solving um, means different things in different places. So, like, I like working on my problems. It might not look like we've solved anything, but to me, they feel like we've made progress. So it's just like it's really a question of um, what counts as uh, the sort of thing you like to work on and make progress in. 
And it's fair. If you don't like these problems, you think they're not moving in the way you want to go, that's fine. You go do you. Uh, you know, I kind of hate that too. Sort of a very uh, c uh, contemporary statement. You be you. It's just because we can't be like, well, go kick ass because you're going to get paid a lot. You can. Only, the best we can do nowadays is, uh, you know, go try to, you know, make an identity for yourself because we don't have any sort of social uh, remun remuneration anymore for, uh, you know, getting paid or have a great job. Just you, you do you. <laughs> I wonder if I'm trying to think of something better to say than that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, uh, Victor Sawyer. Uh, maybe I was overly sensitive, but I just like to say, you know, the other there's all sorts of. Well, it's like go sit a semiotics. It's like someone say, go be your, go live your best life, and I find this very uh, strange at the moment. You go become yourself. <laughs> uh, size matters, doesn't it? Um. Yeah, well, it's like, go be your li go live your best life. Like, it's like, well, it's a very sort of like putting everything on the individual. It's a sort of like, it's a weird sort of um, pulling away. It's like, well, you can go do you and I'll do me and we'll all be happy like separate. So, yeah. Well, yeah, Nietzschean sort of like overcoming. I wonder if we're going to hit any Nietzschean concepts here, too. Like, where it's... W reproduction is not so much uh, reproduction, but is like an overcoming. We might get something like that at some point in this essay, which would be interesting. So. I'm still trying to think of how to answer Victor Sor, like, the kind of thing where people say, well, I don't like philosophy, it doesn't really solve anything. Like, what should the response really be to that? And I was I'm not saying that Victor Sor said that. They didn't. Um... But, like, the question is, like, how do you actually describe uh, progress in philosophy? Which is an old problem to have. Philosophers have been known since at least the ancient Greeks for having their heads in the sky. Not really paying attention. So, this is a general question I have. Not directed at anyone. Okay. Anywho. If you think Lewis is wrong, that a single thing does not contain multiple identities, perhaps what drives your intuition is a sense of spatial connectivity. Intuitively, you might say that this devil's ivy reproduces when a shoot is physically disconnected from its parent. But is spatial connectedness really the best means of judging when reproduction has occurred? It seems reminiscent of pre-18th century thinking. An intuition rooted in a very human perspective of the world, which forgets that reproduction has to do with marking history, not only space. So what can be done to update how we think about biological reproduction? Okay, and I just want to point out, that when I was criticizing earlier the author's use of time, and I was saying it was a, his, it was a genealogical history, not a, uh, a mere question of time, they could have said time right here, but they said marking history. So genealogical history is the more important concept. Maybe they were going for the bigger idea above, but when they came down to it, this is what like I, I was would have preferred them say above. Marking genealogical history, and they just said history here, which is fine. So, Victor Sorry says, as a philosophy mind... Oh, since Semiox first says, I would retort, how much have you solved without using philosophy? Uh, I've solved basically nothing, Sinus Semiotics. I solved nothing at all. <laughs> Victor Sor says, as a philosophy minor, I became very aware of how easily others discounted philosophy as not a real science. I also learned that, unfortunately, the other side of the coin is that many philosophers don't use logic as much as they could, which lends to this sort of stigmatization. Yeah, and you know what the funny part is? These are like sociological problems. And so it, you feel like, oh, if we only figured out the right way to describe things, it could be solved. But that's not really true. It, these are like deeply rooted uh, historical things about like what... Um, is progress what is good to do so there are bigger problems uh, than just like oh if I got the right way to describe philosophy it'd be okay but that's uh, not gonna that's not gonna work never has okay rethinking the concepts that we used in biology has led to advances that can be as important as empirical discoveries natural philosophers and scientists used to believe that organisms were formed through the process of generation rather than reproduction they also used to believe that all microbial life was asexual. The concept of reproduction and asexuality were introduced in order to help explain what was observed. 
but that didn't comport with the conceptual frameworks that were available at the time. These changes led to important advances in how we think about life. It seems we might be at a similar juncture today. Throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, we've learned a great deal more about just how much bi of the biological world is composed of asexual organisms, which, of most of which exhibit various kinds of fission processes. Unfortunately, this new view of life does not always fit well with the concept of reproduction we inherited from the European naturalists and philosophers of the 18th century. Updating the concept of reproduction might require rethinking whether that plant in your living room or garden in this moment is really complete and fully there. It might be a kind of life that's very unlike you in that regard. It might be much more like some hard-to-fathom creature from a work of speculative fiction. Eh, yeah. we just... Speculative fiction, maybe more like a work of speculative philosophy. It's going to be out there, but I mean, I don't know if fiction really uh, treats plants um, any different than uh, like the natural world. We were just discussing plant uh, building worlds in uh, the previous paper by, uh, when we were discussing the fiction of Ursula K. Le Guin. And, uh, you know, it's funny. It's like they could have had very different plants, but I felt like the um, fantasy stories and the you know, sci-fi stories, they tend to treat plants pretty similarly. Victor Shore says, I think the cold truth is that many people try to categorize others due to concerns about social status and competition. Many will try to stereotype fields in order to establish power over those who study in such fields because so many people are susceptible to accepting stereotypes. And you'll stop here and listen to my analysis. You can keep talking. It's cool. Um, That's definitely part of it. People um, want to rank the world. This is one of the things people do. And you can see that nowadays. Top 10 this, top 5 that. Best games of all time. People want to have like an organization to their world, and uh, they do it for various reasons. Some of it's social status and competition. Other reasons are they just like to ha think they make sense of the world, and uh, but that has really important effects on how they interact with things. Because like uh, there's like been psych studies that show once you put like numbers to things, people think that like the first and like the ones like lower on the list, the, there's a big difference between them. Even if in reality, the first five are almost identical. The fact that once you start ranking them, people treat them very different. And so it's like these things have major consequences just by how we are categorizing stuff. And so it's is, um, it's how people are. And uh, you can go, study psychology and figure out why that is but like this is a fact and we have to you know contend with it and how it will affect how we view the world especially when talking about things like this because why should things uh why should one way necessarily be better than another way about talking about something we don't know Rethinking reproduction could require accepting that asexual life just doesn't fit our intuitions about identity and individuality, about where one thing begins and another ends. At the very least, it shows that as life evolved, some of its twists and turns led to distinctly different processes of reproduction and development, but in other cases, reproduction and development are simply the same process. So when looking to identify the boundaries of a species, the branches on the tree of life, or even what counts as life itself, we should be careful about assumptions that come from our very human perspective of biology. New observations made by biologists not only show us how amazing and fascinating life is, but these observations also challenge some of the most elemental concepts we use to understand life too. Oopsie. Elemental. Where one organism ends and another one begins may simply depend on whether you're thinking about it as an object in space or an object in time. Sinisemiak says, the claim that philosophy is not a real science is itself a philosophical proposition. Those dumbass geniuses shake my head. Yeah, see, that's the problem, though, Sinisemiak. The, these are not the people that, uh, th that sort of thing. It's like, they, they don't realize it's like, the fact that you think this is because some philosopher established this as a thing to do. And you're just referring to a philosophy, and it is a philosophy, and yeah, and... I want to smack Neil deGrasse Tyson every time he talks about philosophy. He's like one of the worst at it. He just, well, Neil deGrasse Tyson isn't a worker drone, but like he, uh, it's like if you don't appreciate that you have a philosophical position because that is a, your philosophy, that is philosophy and you just accept it, then uh, you get your head up your butt. 
Victor says, I think it is because ranking theoretically has its roots in our ancestral competitions for higher social status, dominance, or alpha status for males. I think our current concerns for social status appear to be similar to their evolutionary roots. Yeah, I mean, you might be like that, like that might be the standard view in evolutionary psych at the moment. I don't know. But like, I, I know it's a fact that this is something we do. So, yeah, it's like, absolutely. Like, why is this the case? Well, there's a, you can give that evolutionary psych story and that may well be the right one. But I'm, my concern is just how to contend with the fact that we are this way. <sighs> yeah, I just want to say about like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think he's a fantastic uh, science communicator. He was an excellent scientist when he was doing science. Um, he's great for... Um, uh, he's been great for New York and the uh, Hidden Planetarium, where I think he was he was a director for a long time. I might still be, um, but like he, when he talks about philosophy, he doesn't realize that it's just like he's taking certain philosophical positions and uh, butchering them. Basically, and it's like no, you're talking philosophy right now. It's just you're butchering it. All right, but about this last thing, this is the end of the uh, this is the end of the essay. You see. What I find interesting is that we're going back to these old... This person this whole time is saying we have to move beyond these old concepts from like the 18th uh, century. But when you come down to it, they're still using these really old ideas to even talk about the whole subject. Like elemental concepts. We're still in this like atomism, these sort of like fundamental things that we put together to build life, to build ideas. And it's like this sort of similar... We're, we're still in the we're not in like contemporary times we haven't really escaped modernist philosophy like the modern philosophy goes back 500 years we're still in this world like we have not escaped the modern world which is going back to like five fifteen hundred and so like we're still using way too many of these old ideas to think that we're going to actually escape the and uh create something new yet uh, we're really not there in my opinion Victor Soar says, the two pillars of science are empiricism and logic. Philosophy is logic from your point of view. You cannot be as confident in your premises without empiricism, but you do not have the power of any ideas without logic or philosophy. Yeah, you know, that's not a bad way to break it down, especially when you're talking about science. It's like, well, what is the data and how are we reasoning with that data? Um, so that's a pretty good way of looking at uh, the scientific point of view. But the problem is, of course, if you do not realize that the logic is of a certain kind and like that is inherited, it has its own history, its own life to it. It's not a lot of times I think uh, scientists don't realize that the logic that they're using is inherited and has properties for very historical reasons and not necessarily the uh, ones they think they are. And same with empiricism. But, uh, you know, the science is usually pretty good about the empiricism, but the logic, I, I fear that they don't quite understand um, maybe not the empiricism either, but I mean, I, I'd grant that the scientist looking at the world has a very good understanding of empiricism, but I don't think they understand the history of logic. But yeah, what I want to say about this is that we're still using these really old sort of concepts to talk about all of this stuff. And that's kind of what the whole point of this essay is that we don't have the right concepts to talk about reproduction yet and the more we get into biology the further away from our concepts uh we're getting the uh, victor source says true the two accepted forms are deductive and inductive which refer to very specific forms of logic i don't know much outside of the standard forms of logic sometimes um the third that is thrown in there is abductive which is uh sometimes i think unfortunately referred to as inference to the best explanation um which is what you know if you have deductions but like they don't cover all the things and you have inductions and like they cover some of the things but then if you have like some novel information you have to come up with a way to reason to that and yeah that's abduction um so you can look that up if you're interested in it so it's called abduction and sometimes in the literature it's called inference to the best explanation but i prefer inference to any explanation when you don't have one is usually um better and then then you can rank those uh, according to which ones are better than others so inference to any explanation then some of them are of course ridiculous like the the uh, martians uh cause things on earth well that is an explanation not a very good one 
Victor Sor says, I see I came also came across the idea of foundationalism, coherence is two epistemological approaches. Yeah, those are the uh, sort of the big dogs in the structure of knowledge. Uh, is all knowledge based off of like some foundational statements or is it more like a web of ideas that sort of all work together? Um, these are talking about the structure of how knowledge is sort of represented. Um, yeah, I mean, th that's but like that's sort of high level understandings of what sort of how to understand knowledge as a uh, whole. Like, is it built up like a inverse pyramid, like from like some points and up and out? Oopsie, sorry. Is it built up like some period and like up and out or is it um just like is a cloud, a web of things? So, yeah, so this whole essay, I think is actually a really nice essay. And, um, but I mean, again, it's sort of like, this is the struggle at the moment. Or we're sort of trying to get, you know, as Nietzsche would say, is like to overcome like our old ideas and we're not there yet. And I never thought Nietzsche got out of it either. But like, this is the thing. He could see the trouble that we were in. We are bound by our old language, our old concepts, our old grammars. Uh, grammatical structures and we sort of like this is we're bound by our own biology here we look at reproduction as we do it and the farther and farther we get away from it the more we're failing to understand and describe how the world actually is and so this is like just an interesting sort of like historical look at just all of philosophy in the last like 200 years where we're starting to learn more and more about the world and it's just getting weirder and weirder and weirder and we don't have the concepts for it so this is one of the areas where it's really showing up, where we can just look at like any number of things. Like you can just look at a house plant and you realize you can't describe how it's reproducing. And we do this every day, all day. We've been doing this for thousands of years is like breeding plants. But what does that mean to breed plants? Like what is the full, what counts as the organism? Is it the, like the one or is it the, all the uh, cuttings you've made? I don't know. But yeah, it's like we're just starting to realize that the ideas we've, what we understand of reproduction is not what actually is going to get us uh, moving forward to really understand the natural world a bit better. Root beer review. What do we got? For philosophy of it, are there definite objects as philosophy? What do we got here? It's from Synesemiotics. Oh, okay. We've got a uh, a paper on f for philosophy roulette. Objections to film as philosophy. Are there definite objections to film as philosophy? Uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I'll leave it on the. Uh, I'll leave it like over here somewhere. So what is this? This is what. Oh, this is what we read earlier. This one was another one you just suggested. We can leave it right there. Okay. But yeah, anything else to say about... Oh, Victor Sor says, I remember that Dawkins points out mutations in asexual reproduction causes new species, whereas mutations in sexual reproduction causes evolutionary adaptations. Uh, I I kind of figured that out. Since semiotics, I didn't want to say anything, but it's like I, when I read it, I, I don't like immediately register it. I'm like, oh yeah, that is. But um, yeah, <laughs> root beer review. Because I noticed everything was coming off of that. From some of the stuff you were posting in the past. Yeah, see, this is one of the things, Victor Sort. This is what I think that this author would, you know, take a have a problem with Dawkins. Because Dawkins has a very specific idea of um what is important in evolution. And at least assuming we're talking about Dawkins of the uh selfish the selfish gene Dawkins. So the um, if you're looking at the genetics, then any split from an individual, uh, the original to like something with a different genetics is a different species in terms of the genes because it's not an exact copy in terms of the genes. So, yeah, that would be from the perspective of the genes on the genes first view, then it would kind of be that way. But that is a very narrow view of what's going on. And this author would say, hey, look, you know, you're just focusing on a very narrow kind of reproduction, genetic reproduction, whereas all this other stuff that we've just talked this whole essay about, 
does not really get does not line up with the genetic point of view because how do you actually uh, discuss like whole multicellular organisms um, in the genetic point of view because there's like different differentiation and all sorts of things so it's um yes Dawkins could hold that position given a gene focused view but again that is not going to cover all the variety of uh, biological life so no I mean I understand but like it's interesting it's like why would Dawkins say that well he's pushing his uh, position basically in my opinion so yeah I find that sort of position interesting, the uh, genetic, uh, the selfish gene, because it's like, it's very narrow, like you're taking a very hard line, like just selfish gene, like that's it, that's the only, that's what everything is, and so you can push it, but it's, um, it's not going to work overall, but like it's just a, uh, it's very single-minded, and, see, see, and seeing how far you can push that idea is kind of a cool project, yeah. Okie doke. Let's see. Anything else to say about this? Oh. I find this one this weird that where you're calling you're just calling things different names and then you split it and you don't call it like where a, na a road can be like have multiple designations. It's a unit of selection. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the position of uh, well, what counts as a unit of selection in a semiotics? Um, yeah, no, no, I got yeah, But, like, why is that the primary unit of selection? The whole point of, like, reproduction at our level is that, like, human beings are the unit of, se of selection. And then um, Dawkins is like, no, no, it's the genes. But then basically this entire essay is saying, well, look, maybe it's the unit of selection. You can't even narrow it down because things separate and come back like those uh, jellyfish. They break into pieces and then they come back. You can't even get a, a stable unit of selection. Yeah. Victor Story says, personally, I think that Dawkins is one of the best philosophers I've ever read. His point, from my point of view, are very logical. Yeah, I mean, you can like that. Like, I understand. Like, it, it's a very straightforward view. We're going to say, this is the way that this stuff, like, you can do the, like, you can reason from the idea of the genes, then going uh, through everything else. I don't think it's going to work, like, overall. Like, it, but it, again, he can get a really long way with that. And, but I mean, for some of the reasons that were discussed in this essay, too, because we can't actually, uh, narrow down the unit of selection because if you just look at the genes I don't think you're going to get the whole story and uh, that's the problem you're just going to miss a lot of stuff and then I wouldn't even be surprised if people um, went uh, dogmatic at that point and say hey look this is the limit this is what uh, evolution is is the gene is the unit of selection that's it and then everything else is extraneous but that's just uh, like a hard dogmatism yeah So, yeah, we can agree to disagree. I mean, if you like it, it's cool. I like other things, and that's cool, too. So, yeah, I mean, um, anything else to say? I'm not entirely, like, we can discuss all sorts of stuff with uh, philosophy of biology if people are interested in philosophy of biology. Uh, so many things. There was actually a new article on units of selection, not units of selection, um... is the SEP. Um, well, he's gone political also. But I mean, he, the selfish gene is... Um, what's no? Um, let's see. Theories of Biological de Development. New, June 3rd. So this is the uh, Plato... Um, the Stanford Encycl Encyclopedia of Philosophy located at plato.stanford.edu. We have a brand new essay on theories of biological development. So if people are interested in this, you have a huge essay with tons of references, all sorts of things to uh, read up on. If people are interested in this, I'll throw this in chat for a sec. But this just came out. Not persuasive rhetorically, and he's an asshole, basically. Yeah, I don't love his personality. 
Yeah. Oh, of course. And many philosophers are assholes. And uh, synesthetics will remind you that I'm fascist quite often. So, yeah. But yeah, if people are interested in more uh, discussions of biological development, I was going to read this. I haven't even gotten to it. But we've got epigenesis uh, discussed, preformation, all sorts of good things. Yeah, the God delusion and Dawkins. That's true. I don't know as much of his politics. I don't care as much about that stuff. Um, the selfish gene was interesting for a bit for me, but I moved on from that. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah, look, I mean, this is just all flying by, I know. I'm sorry. But, like, yeah, so there's a whole new article on this. Let's see, this was written by, all right, not these people, Melinda Bondi, Bonnie Fagan and Jane Mineshine. Okay. But, anywho. All right, so I've been going a little over two hours. Um, I think that'll be it for now. As was noted, my voice is not uh, going to hold up a huge amount more. So if any of anyone has any uh, final um, comments, get them in now. Otherwise, I'm going to go see if there's someone to uh, read. <laughs>